Hi there and welcome to our latest video on British airships. Today we're going to look at an often overlooked airship story, which is the tragic flight of the R-38, or also known as the ZR-2. Our story takes us back to the end of the First World War, when the British Admiralty laid down plans for a new larger class of airship. The main requirements were for a ship to be able to patrol the North Sea for six days, without support and as far as 300 miles from the home base. During the First World War, the British Admiralty had been very successful in using non-rigid airships as observation platforms, and in a limited way, active defence against the German submarine threat to Allied shipping. With the new requirements for a rigid patrol ship, came the design specifications that it would have a combat ceiling of some 22,000 feet to make it out of reach of most intercepting aircraft at the time. The specified range was to carry enough fuel for 65 hours, or nearly three days, at a top speed of 70 miles an hour. The ship was also required to be armed for the defence of ships whilst on escort duty and for attacking other aggressors. This meant that the ship would carry 12 bombs, have a one-pound gun on the top of the ship, along with further 12 pairs of machine guns spread along the top, lower gun pit and the engine and control gondolas. With these requirements, it was suggested an airship with a gas capacity of some 3 million cubic feet and a length of some 750 feet. In September of 1918, the Admiralty gave the contract to one of the four current British airship manufacturers falling to the Shorts brothers, who were based at Cardington. At the time, the single shed at Cardington was not large enough for the design dimensions of the ship, so a compromise was made, making the ship 699 feet long with a diameter of 85 feet, which was dictated by the roof clearance. The war was continuing, however, on 11th of November 1918, the armistice was signed between the Allied powers and Germany, which ceased hostilities. It wasn't until the 28th of June 1919, with the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, that the state of war was officially ended, and despite the armistice, there was always a worry that fighting could erupt again. At Cardington, the designers had been busy and construction work had begun on the R-38 in February of 1919. However, with the signing of the treaty, it was decided that the order for the R-38 be cancelled. One of the agreements of the treaty was the division of the remaining German Zeppelin fleet be made among the Allied forces. In June of 1919, some of the German Zeppelins were destroyed by their crews rather than be handed over to the Allies. This swift and simple action denied the Americans of two of their allocated rigid airships. It was then decided that the British Admiralty offer up the partially constructed R-38 contract for a sum of $2.5 million, giving the Americans a brand new airship and training for their officers and crews. This was agreed and work continued on the ship. She was then completed on the 7th of June 1921. On the evening of Thursday the 23rd of June 1921, the newly completed ship emerged for the first time from the shed at Cardington. A local test flight had been arranged during the coolest part of the day to maximise lift, and this was in the evening. The R-38 would walk out of the shed at 9pm, and after some pre-flight checks, the six engines were started. Just after sunset at 9.52, she was launched. For her first flight, the R-38 flew out over the local Bedfordshire area, carrying out tests on her engines and steering controls in flight. The ship then returned to Cardington at 4.30am in the morning. During the seven hour flight, some problems were noticed with the overbalance of control services on the ship's tail. Some minor girder damage had also been noted and the suggestion was made that strength of the structure had been sacrificed for lightness. The R-38 was returned to the shed for adjustments to the control surfaces and also repairs to the girders. For her second flight, on the summer evening of the 27th of June, the ship emerged again in the calm evening air. At 9.45pm, the ship took off for further testing and trials. As before, the ship returned to Cardington at dawn on the 28th of June. A third test flight was taken on the evening of the 17th of July, and it was decided that the ship would be brought out of the shed earlier, as the press had not been able to take any photos of the ship on the last two flights, as it had been too dark. 
The Cardington Shed was not going to be her home, and then the ship was going to be moved up to Howden in Yorkshire. This time it was decided that the launching would be around 7.30pm. The R38 was now painted up in her ZR2 colours. The ship launched and then flew around the town for her last flight to her local area, and then she turned and flew out over the North Sea. She returned to Howden in Yorkshire at dawn on the 18th of July. During this flight, again it was noticed that some of the girders had buckled and work was taken to strengthen them. The R38 was walked into the shed to make the repairs. During the next few weeks in August of 1921, the ship had to stay in the shed due to the approach of a series of summer storms caused by an unusual depression over the Atlantic. The ship was unable to be walked out of the shed due to the strong winds. During this time, it gave the American government more time to plan for the arrival of their new ship, and it was suggested that a tour of the United States would be put forward. At last, on the 18th of August, the weather improved and stabilised, and the ZR2 was now ready. The trial was for the ship to fly from Howden to Pulham Airship Station in Norfolk to carry out speed tests over the North Sea. Whilst at Pulham, the ship would also carry out mooring trials with her new nose mooring capabilities. At that time, the only airship station that did have an experimental mooring mast was Pulham, and this would be used to trial the new gear. On the 23rd of August, the ZR2 emerged from the Howden Shed. The ship's commanders, Commander Maitland and Maxwell, along with the ship's captain, Captain Wan, brought the crew complement consisting of 27 Royal Air Force crew members, 17 United States Navy officers and crew, three civilians from the National Physics Laboratory and two Royal Airship Work personnel from Cardington. In total, that made up 49 crew and civilian passengers. Her six engines were brought up to speed at 7.10am and she received the signal to launch. The ship flew two circuits of the Howden Airship Station and then eastwards out to the North Sea. After a series of trials over the North Sea, the ship was tested for her top speed and turning capabilities. At the end of the day, Captain Wan turned the ship towards Norfolk and the Pulham Airship Station. However, when arriving in Norfolk, and then some 15 miles from the airship station itself, the ship was met by a large bank of fog and extremely low cloud. From the low height of 700 feet, which was virtually the length of the ship itself, it was impossible to see the ground. So it was decided to turn around and return out to the North Sea and spend the night over water. The ship signalled that it would wait off the coast until daybreak and use the time for more speed trials. For the crew, it must have been pretty miserable as no sleeping bags had been issued and so they slept on simple bunks which had to be arranged. On the next morning, Wednesday the 24th of August, the ship flew over the Howden airship base and then back out to the North Sea. At noon, the ZR2 reported her position as 28 miles off Felixstowe and decided another curious probe to the Pulham airship station again. Sadly, the cloud height had not changed and visibility had not improved for landing. It was then decided to continue with tests out over the Humber estuary. At 5pm, a signal was sent out by the Air Ministry that arrangements would be made that the ZR2 would land back at Howden at about 7.30pm. It was decided again that more tests be undertaken and flying in the vicinity of the sparsely populated Holderness Plain at about 54 knots at 2,000 feet for the ship. Now that all the tests had been completed, the cloud was beginning to break up. The ZR2 emerged from the clouds over the Alexandria docks of Hull on the Humber River. It was now just after 5.30pm and people of the town were leaving work or taking in the sun on a fine Wednesday evening on the Victoria Pier and Promenade. The crowds looked up to see the silver ship fly over them at 2,500 feet. People could make out the details on the ship, such as the floor-to-ceiling windows of the control car. It was at this time that eyewitnesses saw what was seen as the ship begin to crumple along the midsection and a great wrinkle along the side of the ship along the hull. Some observers said a cloud of vapour could be seen turning the ship from a silver colour to a dark grey. This would have been most certainly water ballast discharging and vaporising in the turbulence around the hull. 
It was then with a roar that the front section of the ship broke away and the engines were then silenced. The nose of the ship tilted down and then tore itself away from the rest of the hull. It was at this moment that the nose cone detonated as the hydrogen from the ruptured forward bags was stirring the turbulent air. A second blast followed within seconds. This started to spread fuel oil as it was discharged from the ship's fuel tanks over the surface of the river. The explosion was so loud that it was reported that windows were shattered over a large area, knocking some people over and others being cut by flying glass. At this time, only the forward part of the hull had been destroyed. The remaining part of the hull and the tail section hadn't caught fire, and this glided slowly downwards at an angle of 20 degrees. In the tail section, crewman Harry Bateman quickly put on his parachute and then ran out and jumped out of the tail cockpit. However, as he jumped, his parachute caught on the tail and left him hanging as the ship descended. Two other crew members, Walter Potter and Norman Walker, made their way through the descending tail section to the aft cockpit. They saw Harry hanging there and managed to drag him back onto the ship. The tail section of the ship levelled out as if it was an, a controlled landing or for a touchdown and gently landed on the river. The lower fin made a soft impact landing on a sandbank. Norman Walker surprised himself by jumping off the tail cockpit just before the ship impacted the water, only to find himself submerged to his waist due to the shallowness of the water. The men were remarkably lucky as the tail section had landed on what was known as the middle sand close to Victoria Pier, and the tide at the time was low so they were saved from being swept out to sea. Tragically, only three men survived the crash. The Court of Inquiry findings stated that the lack of vital information regarding many of the new features introduced in the design, but with the lack of proper aerodynamic information, also the lack of examination to these features, was to blame for the loss of the ship. The townspeople of Hull still mourn the loss of the ship and the crew, and many are buried in the Hull Western Cemetery, which can be visited today. You can also see a memorial to the fallen in the Royal Aeronautical Society headquarters in London. This brings us to the end of another airship story. We hope you like it and then don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel and we'll be bringing you some more videos on British airship history in the future.